Prepare for a rude awakening. Now we come to the next month, the fourth month, and we have the month on the Jewish calendar, which is entitled the month of Tammuz. Now, what is the month of Tammuz about? Where did that name come from? Because we read in Ezekiel 8 how that God is taking Ezekiel into the back way, into the temple. By revelation, that is when Ezekiel is busting through the wall and going in the back way, and God is telling him to dig deeper, dig deeper. Let's see what's going on behind the scenes. He takes him into the temple and shows what is going on in the temple, and God says it's an abomination. Then he takes him further and he says, I'm going to show you an even greater abomination, and he shows them women weeping for Tammuz. Women weeping for Tammuz. This was an abomination. Now, who is Tammuz? Tammuz is the son of Semiramis, or Beltus, who was the wife of Nimrod. Nimrod is the man who built the Tower of Babel. And according to Babylonian sun god worship uh, teaching, it was Nimrod, when he died, he ascended into heaven, and he literally became the sun. Now he is the sun god, the Babylonian sun god. And his wife, Semiramis, a great time later, she becomes pregnant. His widow becomes pregnant, but not in a way that you might expect. She becomes pregnant because the rays of the sun, her husband, Nimrod, have impregnated her, and now she is going to give birth to the reborn sun god, and she calls his name Tammuz. And his birth date is December 25th. Now, this isn't any real news to, uh, to the Israelites because remember, we were down in Egypt and the Egyptian sun god, Ra, he was born on December 25th. And just about all ba uh, sun god worship originated in Babylon, so when we were taken into captivity in Babylon to have the Babylonian sun god born on December 25th, that would be common. And then, of course, uh, many years later, when Antiochus Epiphanes came in and conquered Jerusalem, roasted a sow on the brazen altar, defiling the altar, and then it, he set up a statue of Zeus, the Greek sun god, in the temple on Zeus's birthday, December 25th. Many years later, the Romans had the habit of, of crucifying the Jews, torturing them to death on the cross of Mithra the Mithraic cross, because Mithra was the Roman sun god, and you can look it up in the Encyclopedia Britannica and see that Mithra's birth date is December 25th. There's one day, I'll guarantee you, that Yahshua of Nazareth was not born, it's December 25th. This has all to do with pagan sun god worship. And yet we see this is what this whole thing about Tammuz is, and December 25th, and of course an older calendar, the uh, Gregorian, excuse me, the, the Julian calendar, in which December 25th occurred at the winter solstice. And so it is that Tammuz, the reborn sun god, lived for 40 years. In his 40 years, he was killed in a freak hunting accident, and he was gored by a wild boar. Now, after that, they then set aside 40 days of weeping for Tammuz, one day for each year of his life. So that's where the 40 days of weeping for Tammuz came about. But many years later, his mother, Semiramis, or Beltus, she died. But as luck would have it, she did not stay dead. When she ascended into the heavens, the gods sent her back to earth in this giant egg, which came down from heaven on the first Sunday at sunrise, after the vernal equinox, that Sunday sunrise, in which Easter, the goddess of fertility, came down out of heaven, landed in the Euphrates River, busted out, and turned a bird into an egg-laying rabbit. Ishtarte, Easter, the goddess of fertility, the naked fertility goddess of the, of the East, was 
the reborn Semiramis, the wife of Nimrod, the mother of Tammuz. Now, it was then that they would set aside the 40 days of weeping for Tammuz that would culminate on Easter Sunday. And that was the day they would then kill the wild boar that killed Tammuz and eat ham on Easter Sunday. And of course, many years later, it's, uh, as uh, the worship of Ishtarte or Easter developed, then the priest of Easter would impregnate virgins on the altar of Easter at the sunrise service, and one year later they would sacrifice those three-month-old babies and then dye the eggs of Easter in the blood of those sacrificed infants. And even in America today and around the world, there's one denomination that only allows the eggs of Easter to be dyed blood red. If you ask them why, they have no idea because they inherited it from their forefathers. But it goes right back to the sacrifice of infants and the worship of the sex fertility goddess of the East. But still, if you ask most denominations why they dye Easter eggs, they don't know that is the memorial, the rehearsal of child sacrifice. But yet, these are the kind of things that have been brought into what people call the worship of the true God and is nothing but pagan sun god worship, and God calls it an abomination and to have nothing to do with it, never naming the names of other gods and not learning the way of the heathen, do not learn how they worship and serve their gods and say you're doing it unto me. It's an abomination that is so repulsive and vile and disgusting that God has to use the, the hardest word in the Hebrew language and yet I hear people say, well, that's not what it means to me. Well, again, it doesn't matter what it means to you, it matters what it means to God. And we serve the true God, and we do what he says. If we love him, we keep his commandments. We do not throw other gods and put them in his face. So it is, the month of Tammuz, and then we go down to take a look at the seventh month, the month of Ethanim, or as it's now called, the month of Tishri on your Jewish calendars, and you see that it is in accordance with the month of September. Sept, September, Sept means seventh. October, octagon, octo, eighth. November, Novus, ninth, December, deca, tenth. Those four months harken back to God's original numbering of the month, whereas January starts out with Janus, the two-headed god of the Roman Empire, and then goes all the way to August, Caesar Augustus, the god of the Roman Empire. So it is that even on the pagan calendar, there is a little bit of a remembrance of God's original reckoning of time, even though the reckoning has completely changed. It's a year and a half ago that I said and wrote, that Y2K is moot. It is totally irrelevant. December 31st, 1999 at midnight doesn't begin a day. It doesn't begin a week, doesn't begin a month, doesn't begin a year, doesn't begin a millennium. Even on the pagan calendar, the new millennium doesn't start till 2001. All that it possibly could have been is a two-digit computer code problem. It had nothing to do with prophecy being fulfilled or God's prophetic timetable. And there were people saying that, that uh, the Messiah is going to return on January 1st or at midnight. What ridiculous things. And then we hear 88 reasons why the Messiah is going to return on October 8th, 1988, and then we change it to 93 reasons why in 93. All of these things because we are ignorant of God's times and God's Moedim. We are to not be ignorant of those things and we will never know the day or the hour of these occurrences. But we can know the times and seasons that we are allowed to know and restoring God's reckoning of time. Now when we come to the, the end of the year, I'll point this out that after 12 lunar months, which each month is 29 and a half days long, Depending on the sighting of the first sliver of the new moon, it's either a 29-day month or a 30-day month. So after 12 months, you could have a year as short as 354 days. You could see how easily the solar calendar and the lunar calendar would get out of sync that way, seeing how there are 365 and a quarter days in the solar cycle. And so what God did is provided a way by which these things could be adjusted. And after the 12th month, then what we do is when the first sliver of the new moon appears, we have a question, what month is it? We'll go back to take a look at what month this could be. 
Because if the barley at the end of the 12th month, if the barley is now Aviv when the first sliver of the new moon appears, it is the month of the Aviv. But if the barley has not reached that level of maturity, the month is called Adar Bet, or a 13th month, to allow the barley to mature. Now this becomes very important in God's reckoning of time, especially on the prophetic calendar. We're going to see how that now begins to work out. Because now, when do years begin? They begin in the month of the Aviv barley. And on our calendar we see that Adar is the 12th month of the lunar year. The lunar month is 29 and a half days long, and the lunar year could be as short as 354 days. The solar year being 365 and a quarter, you have to synchronize the lunar and the solar calendars so that Passover is in the spring of the year in the month of the Aviv each year. And so the biblical Hebrew calendar requires a periodic 13th month to allow for the maturing of the barley crop in the land of Israel. That is where all time is reckoned from, Jerusalem. Now, at the appearance of the new moon after Adar, the barley must be Aviv for the new month to be declared the month of the Aviv. If it's not, it's declared Adar Bet. And last year, in 1999, in the spring, the new moon at the close of Adar was Adar Bet. Jewish Karaites found the barley in Israel that it was not Aviv, so an Adar bet had to be calculated. Now the modern rabbinic calendar, or the Jewish calendar, calculates Adar bet seven times every 19 years, regardless of the barley in the land of Israel. And the calculation was put in place at a time that we didn't live in the land of Israel. So there's a reason why it was done. But now we are living in the land, and so we can go back to God's reckoning of time, Last year, the Jewish calendar was one month ahead of God's calendar, and it was this last fall that that calculation in the reckoning was then made right. Michael Rood will return with some closing thoughts in just a moment. For 2,000 years, the biblical calendar has been in disarray. When Israel was ejected from this land by the Romans, it became problematic to maintain a correct calendar. It was difficult for a people who were scattered over three continents to determine the month of the Aviv barley in the land of Israel. The Jewish people then adopted a calculated calendar that approximated the month of the Aviv to determine when to keep the feast. But this calendar was based solely on calculation. The Roman calendar, which was dedicated to the Roman sun god, Sol Invictus Mithra, who was born on December 25th, was foisted upon the non-Jewish masses who were completely ignorant of the Creator's reckoning of time. The Roman Emperor Constantine expunged everything of Jewish or biblical origin from his government-authorized church and replaced it with the rituals and observances of Babylonian sun god worship. The ancient world plummeted into the Dark Ages, when ignorance and religious superstition reigned supreme for more than a millennium. The biblical calendar was seemingly lost to antiquity. However, since Israel became a nation again in 1948, there has been a revival of the Creator's reckoning of time in the land of Israel. Instantaneous worldwide communications have made it possible for everyone to be alerted to the beginning of the biblical months and years. We are no longer unaware of the Creator's times and seasons, unless we choose to continue living in ignorance. We invite you to join us again next time for episode seven in the 26 part series on the prophecies in the feast of the Lord, the Sabbath, the day or millennium of the Lord. This is Michael Rood from Jerusalem bidding you shalom, peace, and I'll see you when the smoke clears. <laughs>